Hello, good day to History 365 at the University of Albany. Today we're going to be talking about the Islamic invasions of the 7th century AD, an event that fundamentally transforms uh, the geopolitics of both the Mediterranean and also Mesopotamia and the Iranian plateau, um, and not just the geopolitics, it has an enduring um, imprint on the cultural and religious aspect of these regions um, that uh, endures to the current day. Um, if you went back to the early 7th century, let's say 600 AD, um, some of the most uh, Christian parts of the world, places that have a very uh, a deep and integral and, and long-lasting Christian tradition, are Palestine, uh, the, the place where Jesus was actually born. Um, Syria, Egypt, North Africa, um, uh, and as a result of the rise of Islam and the uh, invasions that uh, proceed from the middle of the 630s onwards, all of these places are going to eventually become predominantly Islamic in their religious affiliation. So we have a huge geopolitical change that's going to take place with the rise of Islam, um, uh, as well as an enormous uh, change in uh, religion and culture. So this is actually an instance where military events um, do eventually lead to a dramatic religious and cultural transformation um, across a huge swath of North Africa and Western Eurasia. Now, uh, if we go to, say, 632, um, without question, the most powerful state um, in the Mediterranean is still, surprise, surprise, the Roman Empire. Um, now, we today tend to call it the East Roman Empire or even the Byzantine Empire, um, but uh, it's important to note that they don't. Um, they still believe the, that the emperor and his subjects um, are part of a unitary political tradition that goes all the way back to Romulus in 753. Um, and indeed, following the 6th century reconquests of Justinian, who retakes parts of North Africa from the Vandals and Sicily from the Vandals and also retakes um, big chunks of central Italy from the Goths, um, the Roman Empire still controls big parts of the Mediterranean. Um, uh, at this point, um, the big losses are now Spain, um, uh, parts of, of Western Africa, and uh, Gaul, which is, which is now controlled by the Franks. Um, but still, um, without question, the Mediterranean superpower is the Roman Empire. Um, and then to the east, we still have the old Sassanid Persian Empire, um, which controls much of Mesopotamia and extends into the Iranian plateau. Now, um, up to this point, um, the Arabs uh, have always been a kind of supporting character um, in, uh, you know, for, for basically this, the superpowers of Mediterranean, uh, of the Mediterranean and of Iran. Um, so they may provide auxiliaries um, to various armies. So for example, you can find Arabs serving in Seleucid armies, serving in Roman armies. Um, uh, there's actually an Arab kingdom based in Petra um, that's eventually annexed into the Roman Empire that's now in modern day Jordan. Um, um, but, uh, and, and we also know that the Romans, for example, will engage in diplomatic contacts with various Arabic chieftains um, as a way of uh, organizing and controlling and uh, uh, sort of regions beyond Rome's main military frontiers, another way of projecting uh, Rome's power um, uh, beyond sort of the immediate line of Roman military units. Um, so uh, again, the Arabs who live uh, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula and kind of the immediate uh, uh, periphery beyond the peninsula um, have certainly always been there, and their military um, uh, potential has always sort of been something that's, that the big powers have realized. Um, after all, um, uh, Arabic men grow up in a society that's characterized by pretty much constant low-level warfare, uh, particular raiding for animals. Um, uh, and so therefore, they, they develop from an early age a whole set of martial skills, ranging from just the physical stamina um, to engage in military activities to more specific skills like how to shoot bows and arrows or how to wield a, a sword. Um, now, while the individual warriors, therefore, have this kind of military human capital, um, uh, 
Arabic society is largely um, uh, disorganized politically. Um, it's still organized along kind of uh, 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 gentrilineal lines, so clans um, and uh, 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 tribes. Um, and so therefore, to mobilize the military power uh, of, these, uh, of these warriors, um, you almost need a kind of outside state coming in and saying, hey, um, you know, would you like to serve in the Seleucid army, or hey, would you like to serve in the Roman army? Um, even though that military potential has always been something that's there. Um, now, one thing that is important to note, um, the, uh, particularly the eastern part of the Arabian Peninsula, is also tied in economically um, with the Mediterranean. From the second century BC onward, there's been a very brisk trade that goes um, down uh, the Red Sea and all the way to India and Sri Lanka. Um, and, so, and, and this trade continues to be vibrant in the late Roman period fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh centuries AD. Um, and of course, when you have this whole set of economic networks, um, they also will facilitate the spread of religious ideas, um, particularly um, once the Roman Empire converts to Christianity. You have Roman merchants who are Christians um, who are coming down the Red Sea, and as they are bartering and exchanging, religious ideas get exchanged as well. Um, now, in some instances, this causes uh, uh, entities that are part of this uh, whole sort of network of exchange to simply become Christian. For example, Ethiopia um, uh, adopts Christianity, um, in fact, officially, um, uh, as a result of simply Christian ideas being brought down by Roman merchants. Um, in Arabia, it seems that these ideas sort of uh, enter kind of hodgepodge into the Arabian Peninsula, both both ideas, uh, knowledge of Judaism, since there certainly are also Jewish um, merchants and individuals taking part of this trade, and Christianity. Um, and so while people aren't converting to Judaism or Christianity for the most part, um, it seems that there's a broad familiarity within the Arabian Peninsula of many aspects of Judaism and Christianity, um, both um, uh, sort of various genealogies, um, and even kind of aspects of Christian es eschatology are, um, again, they're, they're kind of, they're in the air and the water in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, and that's the environment in which um, Muhammad, um, who is a, a merchant um, and is sort of, again, part of this Red Sea world, um, uh, emerges. Um, now, Muhammad claims that he uh, is visited in a cave by the archangel Gabriel, um, who basically provides him with a direct link to God, to Allah. Um, and his re revelations um, are... Uh, form kind of the core of what will eventually become the Quran. Um, now, Muhammad is very much a man of his world. Um, he's not simply just a religious leader. Um, uh, he, in fact, is very much both a um, someone who's involved in the economic and political affairs um, and um, ultimately has a problem to which he sort of needs a military solution. He and his followers have been expelled from the merchant city of Mecca, they fled up to Medina, um, but they would very much like to restore their position in Mecca. That, that is going to be done militarily. Um, that being said, it's hard to organize all of these Arabic warriors who, as individuals, are quite formidable as fighters, um, but uh, you, know, you don't have uh, uh, the ability to necessarily organize them or particularly discipline them um, unless you can plausibly convince them that you have a direct line to God. And so here we actually see religion forming a potent, um, uh, essentially catalyst for collective action. Um, uh, Muhammad convinces people um, that he is indeed a prophet. Um, he claims to be a, a, one of a, a, a set of prophets, a succession of prophets, starting with Moses, who was the prophet of God to the Jews, followed by Jesus, who was the prophet of God to the Romans. Notably, Muhammad very much thinks of Christianity as a Roman religion. Um, and then he says, I am the prophet of God to the Arabs. Um, and people are convinced by this and are willing to submit themselves to his leadership and also to submit themselves to his discipline. Um, uh, you know, one, while individual Arab warriors can be formidable when they're 
shooting arrows at you or, or attacking you with a sword, um, uh, Muhammad is quite frustrated because they're not always the most disciplined of individuals. Um, there is no hierarchy that can actually impose discipline upon them in their society. One thing that frustrates Muhammad is um, uh, his warriors, who again, the primary form of warfare is kind of low-level raiding, so you go and steal somebody's uh, cattle or sheep or camels, Ideally, you get some. Uh, you also uh, loot some of their uh, wine if you can get it, or you sell the what you sell the proceeds to get some wine, and then you get rip roaring drunk, and you're not very useful as a soldier for the next couple of days. Um, and indeed, it seems that Muhammad is so frustrated by the drunkenness among his soldiers that he comes up with a solution. He says, "Well, the angel, Archangel Gabriel, I have a pretty much a direct hotline to God. God does not want you to drink him." Um, and this prohibition on alcohol, um, still sometimes honored in the breach, um, is an aspect of, uh, of Islamic um, uh, theology that uh, exists to this day. And it probably was initially closely tied to this basic problem of good order and discipline that Muhammad has as he assembles an army of his religious followers around him. Um, now that being said, as Muhammad is able to use his religious claims to uh, get various warriors to submit to his leadership, as he's able to use religious claims to discipline this army, um, he now has uh, one of the most potent military forces in the Arabian Peninsula. And he uses it first to retake the city of Mecca um, in 632, um, and then he subsequently uses it to uh, uh, effectively exert control over much of the Arabian Peninsula. There aren't really any other military forces that can stand in his way. Now, Muhammad gets sick and dies in 636, um, but the army is still there. Um, now, the succession of who should succeed Muhammad um, is going to be a fraught issue, and this is going to be an issue that's going to define a whole series of conflicts within Islam. But the, the uh, leaders that do eventually uh, are able to, to claim leadership in this army um, realize basically that they need to keep fighting um, if they're actually going to hold all of these followers together. Um, uh, this is a kind of case, you might say, of, a, of an army that's a bit like a shark. It has to keep raiding, obtaining loot, obtaining uh, uh, new resources, if it's simply going to hold together in the first place. And the, probably the fear is, you know, once you let these guys go and they go back to their um, kind of pastoralist lifestyle um, as Bedouin, um, they may not come back. Um, and so therefore, uh, the, uh, almost immediately after Muhammad's death, um, there commence a whole series of raids against, uh, to, to the north against both the Romans and the Sassanids. Now, the big story before the 630s, uh, the big story of the 7th century AD militarily, has been a series of titanic clashes between the Romans and the Sassanids. Um, uh, so we can imagine huge columns of heavy cavalry, the cataphracti, the plebenarii, um, well-disciplined units of infantry, uh, a clashing in quite significant battles and sieges. Um, overall, the Romans have won this series of wars. They've, they've uh, obtained a number of territorial concessions in Mesopotamia, um, although they've also suffered a, a number of setbacks along the way. And indeed, one problem of this back and forth warfare is there's a whole host of cities um, in Syria and Mesopotamia that have been accustomed to surrendering. The Romans come in, they surrender. The Sassanids come back, they surrender. The Romans sweep back and they surrender. They are sort of used to this um, and also learn that, you know, hey, surrendering to an enemy that's overwhelming isn't the worst thing because in the last 25 years we've capitulated, you know, four or five times. Um, this is a, a, a situation that is unquestionably going to benefit um, the Arabs as they start sweeping north. Um, this habit of capitulation that has been built into wide swaths of the population. Um, it also means that our two great powers, the Roman Empire, the East Roman Empire, and the Sassanid Empire are to a degree exhausted. They've been pouring out their military and, military and fiscal resources, hammering each other, um, which makes them uniquely vulnerable 
um, when uh, Arabic armies start sweeping in from the south. Um, now, the Arabic armies that are invading are not particularly large. Um, best guess is it's maybe 10 or 15,000 uh, uh, warriors. Um, that's not a big army. That's probably about the size of a uh, late Roman field army, one of the, one of the, one of the uh, uh, committal uh, field armies that's, that's still the, the main kind of strike force of the Roman Empire. Um, you know, in terms of military equipment, it doesn't seem that the Arabs have uh, all that much that's new or innovative. Um, we actually aren't terribly well informed about their panoply, but as far as we can tell, shields, spears, straight, short, straight swords, um, uh, both, they, do, they do seem to be heavy on archers, which is probably an advantage. Um, but it doesn't seem that they have any sort of immediate technological um, uh, or even tactical advantage over their Byzantine or Sassanid counterparts. So again, have quite advanced armies with advanced tactics, with these heavy cavalry. Um, what gives this relatively modest army an enormous advantage is mobility. Um, uh, and it seems that a key, key aspect to this mobility is camels, um, that they can ride on camels, not really to ride into battle. A camel, when you think about it, is not a particularly optimal animal to ride into battle. It's awkward to sit upon. It actually puts you almost a little too high to strike at an opponent who's below you. Um, and so while there have been camel cavalry, um, uh, and there are also just Arabs who ride horses, um, uh, it isn't necessarily that, there are, that, that this is an all cavalry army. A substantial portion of the Arabic uh, armies are going to be infantry. But they are mounted infantry. Their infantry will get on camels, ride over great distances. Camels have an advantage of they don't need to eat much and they don't need to drink much, so the logistics are simplified. And also, the armies can maneuver through desert areas in Syria and Mesopotamia um, that would otherwise be off-limit to Byzantine and Sassanid armies that have horses. And you know, the downside of having a horse is, at the end of the day, you've got to get it fodder and you've got to get it water. And if you don't, it dies, um, which means there are places that, is Byz that, that Byzantine and Sassanid armies simply cannot maneuver. But this relatively modest, scrappy Arabic army can because it has camels. And this means that the, the main advantage is just tremendous mobility. Uh, uh, an Arabic army that's, that's raiding or uh, even a raiding party um, can cover distances, appear out of nowhere. If it gets into trouble, it can go right back into the desert. Um, and this is, uh, this is a capacity that neither the Byzantines or the Sassanids really have the ability to deal with. Um, and indeed, both suffer a number of uh, extraordinarily bad defeats. Um, early on. Um, for the Roman Empire, I've been calling it the Byzantine Empire, but really we should be calling it the Roman Empire, the East Roman Empire. Um, in 636, uh, the, a field army confronts the um, main army of Arabs at a place called Yamuk in Syria um, in a battle that is fought over the course of roughly a week. Um, the Byzantines are crushed. Um, and this uh, effectively reduces Byzantine power in Syria. Um, uh, to the point that now the, the they call them the Byzantines, the Romans, um, really will only control Anatolia and the Greek mainland and aspects of the Balkans. It, 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 it removes uh, core territory that had been key, a, a key source of, of fiscal resources, of manpower, and also the loss, uh, the early loss that is quite grievous of the Holy Land, which is a very, very important to this Christian empire. Um, is is also going to be an extraordinary ideological blow. Why couldn't the empire, the most Christian empire, um, defend what is the birthplace of Christianity? Um, incidentally, the, the Romans do not immediately realize that this army has a different religion, um, a new religion. Um, they initially identify the Arabs as Saracens, using a kind of antiquated uh, 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 kind of uh, ethnonym, um, but, but to describe sort of peoples who had traditionally sort of raided in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, and religiously, they think, well, these guys are heretics, right? They're Christian heretics. They don't quite believe what Orthodox Catholic what Christians should believe, but they seem to have enough aspects that are identifiable as Christian, including a belief that Jesus was a 
prophet of some kind that we'll call them Christian initially. It takes some time and some kind of familiarity um, before there's a realization that this, these aren't just Christian heretics. This actually reflects an entirely new religion. So the early blows between uh, uh, the Arabs and the Romans uh, immediately uh, uh, causes a dramatic loss of Roman power, and the blows keep on coming. Um, uh, Arabic armies will invade Egypt, they will subsequently sweep across North Africa, um, and will get as far as Spain. Uh, and indeed, when we shift back west, we'll talk about um, how uh, sort of the spread of various uh, raiders um, ultimately um, uh, does not get much past Spain. Um, uh, so this leads to a huge loss of territory for the Romans um, uh, because they've lost Syria, they've lost Egypt, they've lost North Africa. Um, things are worse for the Sassanid Persians. Um, uh, they likewise suffer some early blows in the late 630s and uh, six, uh, early 640s. The last Sassanid emperor is killed in 651, and the Sassanid Empire collapses completely. Um, which is something that the Roman Empire does not do. So this completely transforms our geopolitics. This completely transforms um, uh, uh, the religious aspects. Um, so what we'll do going forward is we will jump ahead um, a bit, probably to the Carolingian era, and next time and we'll talk about um, uh, the army and empire of Charlemagne and, and the rise of feudalism in the medieval West. Talk to you soon.